live. Hi, I believe. Hello, everyone. Welcome to June's Bee Crafts Hangout. And we're really happy that you're here and joining us. My name is Claire Harwood, and I joined the editorial team with Bee Craft in August. And so, I, oh, I think I've got a bit of feedback for myself then. Um, and we have some other team members with us. And if we'd like to introduce ourselves, if everyone's happy to do that. Ah. Fine. Do you want me to start with start with that, Claire? That would be fab, Wendy. I'm just turning my volume down. Okay. Right. Uh, my name's Wendy Dale, and uh, I'm the marketing manager for Bee Craft Magazine, and uh, work closely with pretty much everybody in the team. I'm, I'm in North Devon, and have quite a lot of hives, so um, not that many years experience but I think when you've got a lot of hives you see an awful lot in one year <laughs> so uh, um, hopefully you'll find some of the things that I might have to say tonight some of some use. Thank you Wendy, okay. thanks very much. And Richard, should we go to you? Uh, yes, thank you Claire. So I joined the craft at the same time as Claire, I'm uh, also a deputy editor and um, we've all been finding our way around um, bee craft and and uh, looking at what our particular strengths and interests are. So more recently, I've been concentrating on the magazine. And just today, I've been polishing off, uh, polishing up the um, July edition and getting that off to the printers. So that will be on the printing press tomorrow, hopefully. So um, um, I keep uh, about 15 colonies, 15 hives. Um, and I live near Bath. Lovely. Thank you, Richard. And Rodri, last yeah, but not least. Uh, I'm Rodri. I'm the South Wales representative for Beecraft. Um, I suppose like Wendy, I'm a regular to these hangouts now, so most <laughs> you probably know my face. Um, and you can probably look back on the previous hangouts to see a couple of my introductions, so uh, you probably know all there is to know about me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. And yeah, I should probably say I've, I've just got my uh, first, well, my first very own colony of bees on the 5th of May. Um, so they 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 came and they're keeping me very busy. So I'm yeah I'm really happy to be here and happy that I can try and give some insight as well. So I think we're we're going to get started. We have a couple of other team members that might join us, um, but it's my first time with the hangout, so we've had a couple of technical glitches, but hopefully it'll be smooth sailing from now on. And I think just go straight into some of the questions we've had. They're coming through thick and fast. Um, let me just find the first one now from Joe, And I'll, I'll just read it. So Joe's uh, she's suddenly gone queenless. Uh, Joe could be she or he. Um, and they've got no eggs. So they've checked this weekend. They're not a happy bunch, um, they say. And she's got one queen cell, which I left intact. It's very, very large colony collected from an oak tree swarm last year. So what went wrong and why haven't they swarmed? So the question to the panel is when, when should they go in and check again and what's going on and what are the options? Does that make sense team or would you like me to call, read that out again? No, that's fine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, that's uh, an odd situation because if, if there are no uh, no eggs at all, but there's a queen cell, but it's a large queen cell. Um, that would sound like a, you know, that sounds like a swarm cell as opposed to an emergency cell. Um, I don't know. What do you think, Wendy? Well, being a swarm, I think quite often um, the the queens are older queens, and it's quite possible. I would think that something's happened to the queen during the course of the last few months um, and it's the, the hive itself has possibly decided that the queen is not functioning properly anymore and they've decided to re just replace her that would indicate because they had there's a lot of bees in the in the colony uh, it would seem to me that that is probably what's happened and um with a swarm queen, you never actually know quite what you're getting. Um, and it also, she doesn't say if it's if it's a charged queen cell or a sealed queen cell because that affects the timings um, on when to go in. 
uh, and when to just leave them alone for a while. So are you, are you suggesting that they could possibly be a supersedure cell? Yes. Get, yeah. In which case, yes. not always, but sometimes they're in a slightly different position. You tend to just get one or two further up the frame, don't you? Um, but it's not, they've obviously managed, if that's the case, to find an egg from somewhere if there are no other eggs in the colony. Mm. Okay. Um, uh, to be honest, I mean, it, it depends on the, the state of the queen cell at the moment, whether it's just charged or whether it's sealed. Mm. And the choice there is, uh, if she hasn't emerged, then there is an option there to get another queen and actually put that, um, introduce her into that colony mm. and remove that queen cell. Because actually, if it's just one queen cell, that's quite unusual, Richard, isn't it, Rodri, you think? Yeah, I suppose the alternative as well as to what you said is that she could transfer a frame of eggs from another colony if there's one available. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the key there is, as Wendy said, is it charged or is it is it a capped queen cell? Because that really defines what to do with the colony then. So. I mean, the other option is, you know, check the cell carefully if it is a cell and it appears to be capped because it could be that a queen has emerged and it's they've resealed the cell. Um, and then you've mm. then they've swarmed, um, but it sounds as if there are a lot of bees in the colony. Yes, it would be interesting to know what their temperament is like as well. You know, are they quiet? Are they queen right? Or are they quite you know feisty? They're not happy. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. not a happy bunch. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, mm, I, I mean, I think it's difficult to know what in this sort of to do in this situation. But a, a good. Um, uh, response, as Rodri said, I think is if you have another colony or you know somebody who does um, a frame of eggs and young brood, um, at least gives you a chance to monitor them and see what they're doing. They may immediately start to make emergency queen cells um, from brood, um, you know, which then would help to tell you what, you know, what the situation in the colony is. Yeah, it, it really depends on what stage the queen cell is, I think, doesn't it? And um... I don't know. I it would be useful if Joe's actually listening then to let us know whether it's charged, sealed, um, whether it's capped, uh, and also whether it looks as if it's been been opened and the queen's emerged, or whether um, it's closed. I would say because they're a bit feisty. I would say that they they don't have um, even a virgin queen running around at the moment, so I wouldn't think she's emerged. No. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. I'm is listening. Um, just yeah, to give us more information, that would be wonderful, and hopefully we'll be able to help you a bit more. Um, I'm just sorry, guys. I'm just as I do this, I'm trying to in, in, invite our other team members. Um, so I've just done that now. So hopefully, Claire will be able to join us. Thank you very much for your insight, panel. Um, Let's go to our next question, which is... You got it as one from, one from Mark Gale? That's uh, the one I've got, yeah, mm -hmm. using garlic-infused sugar syrup. Mark says, he, I use it as a deterrent for Varroa and do not feed, feed now or treat with anything else. That's the first I've heard of garlic being used. Is mm -hmm. that something that the team is familiar with? That's a new one on me as well. <laughs> uh, I, I have heard of it being. I haven't used it myself, but I have. I have heard of it. I've read, um, read of it being used, and and people um, reporting good, um, good wow. as a result. Yeah, I'd be interested to know how he infuses um, the syrup. Yeah, it's um, it Mark saying it, uh, in a later email that it's actually his first time on um, on the hangout, and um, I. I haven't any experience of garlic infused sugar syrup, but I do know um, I was quite concerned at one stage um, my first well, first or second year with my hives and we opened them up and got this awful smell and we were really worried that we, we might have foul brood. So we called in the bee inspector and um, he actually opened it up, basically took one smell and said they've been feeding on garlic. So basically garlic. Garlic, um, gar I, suppose, I suppose that's garlic infused honey, if you like, and um, certainly did not smell good in the hive. 
and uh, we have had that in a subsequent year uh, last year i think it was and um we were the bees were right in the middle of basically a wild garlic patch wild garlic. And, um, yes and it's really really awful stuff we've got loads of wild garlic near us um but i've never seen uh, honeybees on it uh, maybe they just go there if there's not very much else around yes I imagine it's normally around at about the same time as the rape probably isn't it um, which, yes it's, a, it's around very early yes now, it's an it's early one go there instead um, it also yeah. to go to shade, doesn't it? Which is might you know mean they tend not to go to it. Yes, it does. Yeah, quite right. But um, I mean, it, it's interesting because if that is a, a help with varroa control, it's a very natural one, isn't it? Mm. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. I suppose it's weighing up whether you, whether you you kind of keep bees for the honey and you're risking having honey that tastes like garlic a little bit, or or you're just kind of wanting to keep healthy colony of bees and not too concerned about the honey i suppose but i think it was yesterday it might have been spring watch which i'm really enjoying watching at the minute they it's butterflies are really fond of um wild garlic and so yeah they, they they're good pollinators um for, for wild garlic so i remember reading something or seeing something about uh, gardeners infusing garlic into a spray for aphids on sort of tomato plants and things like that so oh, right. similar principle I suppose. Well, it's, it's enough to put anybody off, isn't it? If you get a, a, yeah. a large, yeah. um, large yeah. dose of it. No, not me. I love garlic. Oh, do you? <laughs> <laughs> That's why I don't have my friends. No. But that, I, I imagine that at the time that um, Mark would be feeding them sugar syrup, it wouldn't be a time that would affect the honey. I would assume that that was at the end of the season, mm. um, and he's giving them some winter feed. Um, that would be my assumption. I wouldn't wouldn't expect him to give them garlic sugar syrup when there's food around. Yeah, that's true. That makes sense. But, well, that's that's the first. Well, thanks, Mark, for your first experience of, of the hangout as well, and you've given us something um, to definitely think about. So that's brilliant. Thank you for writing in. And I hope, yeah, that helps with the, with your query. Let's see. I've got a question from John Main. And it says, I've recently acquired a full colony of bees that had been left unattended or treated over the winter. I suspected high varroa levels and was about to conduct a shook swarm, but noticed that the queen had died. I've successfully raised a new queen from the brood and she has just returned and started to lay. The brood chamber is now completely empty of sealed cells, so I was looking at varroa treatment options. I think that Max, am I saying that correctly, everybody, M-A-Q-S, may, may be a little harsh on, a, on such a young queen and no brood to keep her in the hive. I wanted to know whether an oxalic acid dribble would work, considering there's no sealed brood and it's less offensive to the bees. However, I've not seen this recommended anywhere. That's a great question. Thank you very much, John. Um, um, well, I, I personally use oxalic any time I think there's an issue with Varroa and there isn't very much brood. Um, so I that would probably be my preferred um, option, either vaporized, which I tend to do, or tripled. So for example, if I've got a new, if I've just picked up a swarm, um, then I will trickle oxalic on them in the first day or two before there's any, any brood. Um, if she's a new queen, presumably she's laying and there is some brood, so you risk, you do risk that. Um, but if you can, um, potentially sacrifice um, you know, a bit of a bit of young brood um, you'll get all the phoretic mites the mites which are actually on the um, on the bees and not in the brood you won't get them all I don't know I think the um, I think it's probably about 90 percent if you're lucky you've got the trickling oxide it so I think that probably is a good potential solution yes mm. I, I'd agree with Richard on that um, and uh, I would certainly do the same thing, um, vaporise or trickle oxalic during, uh, you know, if I collected a swarm. So you're pretty much in a, a new swarm situation, John, um, regardless of the fact that you've, um, uh, you know, it, it, it's not a swarm, but it's pretty much that same sort of situation where the queen is just starting to lay. Um, and uh, I think it's an ideal time, personally. 
but but do it before there's very much more brood otherwise you'll be mm. I, I hate doing it um you know as soon as there's a, a few decent patches um um of eggs or what have you you'll start thinking oh i don't really want to sacrifice this or potentially sacrifice it so it's worth doing it sooner rather than later mm -hmm. um apioxal is the stuff that you um which is the only licensed um oxalic treatment which is what we should really be using now i suppose if she's a very young queen mine she'd be laying now quite rapidly so as you said you, you might want to monitor the the levels of brood just to make sure they are quite low um Personally, I would tend to go for the the mitoway quick strips. I've had quite a lot of success with them. Um, I find them quite easy to use. So, uh, there's alternatives there as well. So. I think I I am um, a bit prejudiced against those because I had some bad experiences with them, particularly with some young queens, a few years ago. But I understand they've been re reformulated and aren't quite so harsh now. So people, other people I know who have been using Max. Um, seem to be quite happy with it uh, now mm, okay. so, you know that's worth considering yeah i have to say i've never used max but i have used um ap far not ap life far it's ap far which is only available through a vet um and um i've actually found that to be very good in um in killing off for our um, that intervention Strip, yeah, the strips that you put into two strips that go into the brood box mm. um, and are left there, I think, six weeks. Um, off the top of my head, I think it's six weeks. Mm. So obviously it's not something you do when they're out collecting. Um, but at the moment, if um, John's obviously hoping to, that you know, there'll be sufficient brood to do a little bit of um, uh, nectar collecting. So it would not be, that would not be an appropriate solution at the moment, but at the end mm. of the end of the season I think that's um personally I find that to be very good um but it's not something any of these treatments you don't want to use on a, a too regular basis because the the, the um but they become immune mm. so and it because I was sorry, sorry Richard. I, I, was, I was just going to sort of reiterate that point because I'm, I'm I've, with my new colony I'm going to have to start thinking about um, varroa treatment and similar to John actually the, the colony hadn't been opened up and inspected for over a year and luckily there's not a huge amount of varroa there but there, are, there is some and, and the advice that I've been given is to wait until uh, the end of the season kind of autumn time and, and I'm assuming that's because the bees are going out foraging um, so you, you kind of wait um, to, to, to do any treatment is that that's the rule of thumb that most people go for i think it just depends on uh how how worried you are about infestation levels yeah um you know if if, if you think they're heavy if you've done a mite drop um uh, test mm. and you know there are a lot to worry about then it's something that you've um you're going to have to um get hold of now um, because you want to make sure that there are lots and lots of bees um, going into autumn to take you into into winter. Mm, yeah. And, and you can you know, produce now. I was about to say something that I've been trialling, which um, uh, I think is working quite well, are these um, bee gyms. I don't know if you've... Um, yeah, that's what I was going to ask if any of us are using those, because that's probably the one I'm going to go for first to try. So, um, you know, it's I don't think... It. I don't think it's uh, you know probably going to solve everything, but I've put them in three colonies, and in each of those I have noticed um, uh, an increased drop of rower immediately below the bee gym. Wow! Um, sort of square-shaped device, and you just sit them um, on the uh, mesh floor, and it's very interesting because if you take some frames out and stare down at it, you actually will see bees grooming themselves using it as a scratching post. Wow! So they That's awesome. Do use them. Um, and they've just bought out that I've just received some little tiny ones. I don't know if you can see these and these you push these into the brood comb on either side. Um, so they're just little um, stations for the, the bees to um, scratch themselves. And there's some quite good video footage um, um, online. So, I mean, I should imagine they last quite a long time. You can just clean them in a bit of soda, um, washing soda solution. So and they're relatively inexpensive. So I think it's something that's worth considering, along with all your other things you may do if you use for example ice and sugar or anything else like that just, just mm. to you know every varroa that you that you knock out of your colonies you know it's going to make a difference isn't it mm. 
Absolutely. I, yeah, I think I, I really want to try them out. And it's really interesting to hear that you're seeing immediate effects as well. I think it's great. And watching the videos as well of all the little bees having a bit of a scratch <laughs> is, is great. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, I feel I feel a Richard video coming on on, on that one. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, hopefully, John, that's helped you a little bit with making some decisions on what to do. Um, just going to make sure I've not missed any other questions coming in. We had, bear with me. I think back to the Varroa subject is one of those ones where every beekeeper has got their own way of dealing with it. And yeah. you can never find two beekeepers agree over this. Yeah. I mean, we, um, up until this year, we've, um, we've always done a brood break. Um, when we've taken pretty much all the brood away, um, just left uh, one frame with eggs to, to hold the queen. Um, but we take the brood and bees away uh, and put them in a different corner of the, the apiary. Uh, you can actually, um, as, as far as I recall, we didn't have any problems with fighting as long as you, you mix, uh, you, you stack three different uh, bees from three different colonies. Two colonies will fight, and three won't. Been told. Um, I don't know who the enemy is. If it's, if it's two, it's, sorry. If it's two, it's binary. Whereas if it's three, they don't know who the enemy is, and, and it right. So that's that is a fact, Richard. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, so I, we take I those. Try in it, but uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm sure we. I'm sure we did it actually. Yeah. If you're if, if you're making up nukes, for example, and, and you take um, frames from two colonies then you you can have have issues with these sort of yeah. but whereas if you take them from three it's it goes through quite smoothly and there aren't really any problems so i think that was probably the case with what you were doing there yeah, yeah. and uh, so you know that way the queen and you obviously put in um foundation so the bees that remain with the queen work really hard and draw the foundation out but it gives you that brood break because she she can't lay initially um because she hasn't got the, the foundation to lay in and the ones you've taken away uh, you check them if you want to to make increase then you can um you can leave a, a queen cell leave one or two queen cells um so that you can increase your colonies or you can destroy all the queen cells and then actually reunite the bees with um the hive that they came from but the theory being that you know in probably three three weeks then that's an ideal time for the the the, heart, the colony where you've left the queen and um, won't have any well, much in the way of varroa um because only there'll only be what was left on the bees um mm. so, so you take away the 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 brood the brood you let the flying bees come back with the queen yeah uh, a new foundation so basically it's like an artificial swarm we unite them at a later date yes but well, if if you want to um otherwise you can you know um you can use the bees in whatever way you need to and newspaper combine if you need to if it's um if it's just a case of two colonies you know two lots of bees coming in together and presumably in that situation because it's you've only got the flying bees in the parent hive and you had an issue with varroa um you could treat them with oxalic then as well yes mm. yeah that's true yeah okay um Thank you. We've got uh, Sue has messaged her, her. Her first question was, "How do I split a hive which has three colonies and one queen since September?" Um, and she's actually expanded on that a little bit more, uh, where she says she's she's has three hives, each with a queen, back in September. Two queens, two new queens disappeared from the two hives, and and she was told to put the two queenless colonies in with the other that has a queen they have been there until now and we have had one super of honey thus far so the question is how, how, how do they split split the colony um, the three colonies but they've got one queen so the three so does that mean the three brood boxes did she unite them and just put all stack them up do you think or it says that I had three hives, yeah. So separate hives, each with a queen. Back in September, I'm just wondering whether or not that she 
she's just put the three brood boxes or however many, how it, depending on what system she ran, on top of one another, or whether or not she sort of united the bees and then took the boxes away. But I suppose the question really is, she, she essentially has one colony, doesn't she now, and wants to make that into two or three? Three, yes, yeah. That's yeah. what I would take from that, yeah. yeah. Is there any advice that we can give Sue? Um, well, yeah, the, it's really the of, of literally splitting, splitting the brood up into, into three units, um, but making sure that each of the unit has, has survived. So you're, if you were to split it into three, you want to make sure that each unit has plenty of food and a reasonable amount of, of brood of sort of all stages. Um, but in particular, the two that don't have the queen, you want to make sure they've got enough young brood because they're going to be making um, emergency queens. So if you remove uh, several frames of um, eggs and brood, uh, larvae um, and put them in a, a box without a queen, um, that is where uh, they will make the two new queens. So you need to okay. make sure the colony is strong enough um, and you need to make sure there are plenty of, um, plenty of young bees um, in the, the other two colonies by shape. Well, it depends if she's probably going to leave them in the same apiary. Um, in which case you'll need to shake off um, plenty of young bees into the two boxes. And the way to do that is to take each frame and give it a bit of a shake, and then most of the flying bees will, will fall away. And what are left in the younger bees. Um, and so um, you probably want to do that to at least two frames of extra bees to shake into each new, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, it's, I'm, I think I'm following that. <laughs> it all gets so confusing sometimes. <laughs> Is that kind of, Wendy? Would you kind of go go along with that? If we've got three, three, three hives, three colonies, but only one of them has got the queen, um, and yeah, she'd like to obviously rear two two new queens for those yeah. those um, colonies. Uh, to be honest, I was uh, I'm I missed part of what um, Richard said because I was um, looking at the, some of the emails that are coming in as, oh, as well. Um, so. Um, I would go, I think, I, I heard the tail end of Richard's and I think that's a, a pretty good way to go. Um, I don't know whether he actually said about putting them into a smaller box, into a nuke. I don't know if he said that rather than... No, in, I, I was assuming it would be a nuke, but she may not well not have two other nukes, I suppose, but um, you could do it, in, couldn't you, in, in her other two brood boxes um, and yeah. keep up tight with some double boards. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the thing is that a brood box is quite big. Um, so, you know, if they're raising a new queen, then I think they've got enough to do if they've got, say, six frames instead of ten. But as Richard said, if, if she's got brood boxes and she's using brood boxes, then um, just um, divide a, or something to put in the brood box to actually reduce its size to the six frames. Um, I've, I've, we have funny names for various things. I can't remember what they're called, Richard. Rodri, help me. <laughs> for the 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 boards that you put in, so dummy, the, dummy boards. The dummy, dummy boards. boards. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was just going to ask, actually, how would you you'd use dummy boards, obviously, or, or use something to kind of fill in that gap, so then they wouldn't yeah. obviously start making natural comb as well. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it depends really on whether or not she's got enough brood combs uh, and food combs in the her existing colony to be able to split it up and make sure that there's enough brood. I mean, in theory, you only need uh, one um, comb of, of brood for them mm. to be able to uh, produce some, some new queens. Um, but ideally, you want to have um, eggs and young larvae, but also some emerging brood, and they're going to be the nurse, nurse bees to look after your others. So in an ideal world, you'd have a comb of sort of nearly emerging brood and a comb of uh, uh, eggs and larvae, so that's two uh, in each new unit, plus mm. um, at least two of, of um, food to sustain them and be prepared to, to feed them. Um, and would you, just to everyone on the panel, because it's it's not we're not quite sure why the, the two the two new queens uh, disappeared, and and Sue says that they were new. So I suppose the, the question that I've got is: it best to, for the the hive to rear their own new queens, or or could Sue just get new and new, buy a new queen and and add them to the hive as well? Is that an option as well? But it seems that that might have been what she'd done before, but they disappeared. Mm. So 
maybe best to work with that existing queen that she's got and and rear them that way um well my my personal preference is always to try and rear your rear your own um but it's yeah. always a little bit riskier because although you split mm. your colony into three two of those queens um still have to emerge go out and mate successfully yeah. and come back um mm. the chances of two of them doing that probably are fairly well she might be lucky but you know i i reckon probably when i when i do that probably i don't know three out of five will mate successfully because they might mm. not be, you know be eaten by a swift or whatever yeah. else so yeah yeah um, so buying in a queen is an immediate option you may better find someone locally who can yeah. supply you some queens if they've got some spares um or even a queen some queen cells yeah yeah first okay one. that's that's great that's lovely advice mm -hmm. thank you well, i hope that helps you sue i'm just going through questions. i've got one from andrew lake do you want me to read it out claire while you're looking at others yeah, that'd be great. Thanks, Wendy. Okay. Um, this is from Andrew Lake. Um, I have two new colonies this year. One is very full with brood of all ages and extremely active. I've seen the queen each inspection except the last when I found two supersedure cells over the weekend. The laying pattern is good and ample but looks like I've lost my year old queen. I think I should leave all supersedure cells. Is that correct? Should I now also run a brood and a half? Rodri? Well, that's an interesting one, yeah. Mm. Uh, so, supersedure, two cells, um, I suppose back to, are they open or closed? Um, yeah, he doesn't say that actually, so... My preference would always, well, it, my preference would tend to leave one queen cell, which I know is open. Yes, that way at least you know it's properly charged and the bees exactly. will actually, um, will finish it off. Uh, right. Any, there's always a danger, I think, when you've got a, um, a sealed queen cell or more than one sealed queen cell, uh, because the first one will come out and go around and, and kill all the others. Yeah. And so you never know if you see a, queen, a sealed cell um, and don't necessarily find an open one, you still don't know whether the sealed one's the queen's alive. Mm. So I suppose in, in that situation, I would probably... Um, if I had a charged one and a sealed one, I would probably leave both, um, but reduce it to the two. At least you know with the charged one that you've got a viable queen, hopefully, that the bees will finish off. Um, and if the other one comes out first, then it cuts down the time that you're waiting for a queen to emerge and mate yeah. and, and go into lay. I wonder if the situation is what he thinks, though, because if there's no queen in there, um, then maybe these are emergency queen cells um, that we're dealing with. Um, yeah. it's difficult to say without being able to ask um, ask Andrew um, quite what it is. But I think, I mean, he's asking. He, he's been specific about supersedure cells. So, mm. um, but. Um, do you think there's is there a di real difference between supersedure and emergency cells then richard or the queens that come from them ah uh, well that's a different matter altogether because some people are very anti queens from um, emergency queen cells aren't they um it'd be interesting if a few of the others were here to hear what they they had to say about yeah. it I've, I've i've never really noticed a difference between queens from supersedure or swarm cells or emergency cells personally i don't know if, have you, have you noticed anything rodri no no i was just thinking that like, there's always been that debate as you said you know about yeah. supersedure or emergency which is the best but same as you i've never really noticed um a difference and in theory i can't see why there should be a difference but unless there's some scientific reasoning behind uh, it i think the theory is just simply that they're in you know they're in, they're in a smaller size cell aren't they and they're bent over in, inside it um, and as a result, the queens, people say, well, they call them scrub queens, I think, don't they? But they mm. say that they're smaller and have fewer um, ovaries. But when I've produced queens like that, either through splitting the colony and forcing them to produce emergency cells, which was the situation we were talking about in the previous conversation, um, or something's happened to the queen, whatever, and they've produced emergency cells, you know, I've had perfectly um, 
adequate, long-lived queens um, as a result, and queens that lay lay well for a long time. So, uh, personally, I don't see the problem with emergency queens. I, I suppose it becomes less of an issue if you requeen in every year or every two years as well. Because uh... yeah, I mean, for for a beginner, um, and I would say myself, I wouldn't necessarily be able to tell the difference between a um, a supersedure cell uh, and uh, an emergency queen cell. I mean, I would always look at the size of the cell. Mm. Um, if you if I've got a, a number of queen cells in there, then I will look at the size. Uh, and you just think, oh, that looks a beauty. Um, and oh, that doesn't look so good. That's a bit squat. So uh, I would just use the size of the queen cell to determine whether I felt it was a good queen inside or not. Mm. I don't know if that's... Uh Sorry to interrupt, Andrew's just come, come back to us and, and says, I assume there are two super procedure cells, one sealed and one charged. They are mid-frame to the side of a frame and, and long and thin, not bent as an emergency cell. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that helps. Yeah. Yes, it sounds like they're either super procedure cells or swarm cells, yeah. Yeah. I would have thought it sounded like, more like super procedure to me. Mm -hmm. um, He's also saying, should I now also run a brood and a half? I don't quite know why he would want to do that, possibly because of the um, uh, honey collection. But by the time the queen emerges, um, she will obviously need space to lay, um, mm. which may not, there may not be insufficient room within the brood box to accommodate that, which is why perhaps he's suggesting a brood and a half. And I think that that's um i always find it difficult running a brood and a half um because it gives you problems the following year actually but um i think probably to ensure there's sufficient space that i i would run brood and a half and i'd give them a foundation to keep them occupied um to get them to draw that out so that when the queen does emerge and um wants to lay that she's got some empty cells to lay in okay that's great, thank you. We've also had Jo who's come back to us. Um, Jo's, jo said help, the, the, she, she'd gone queenless um, and had one queen cell. So if we just go back to that query, Jo um, has emailed back, so she's listening and says we're doing a, a great job. So thank you, Jo, that's much appreciated. Um, she says, it's, it's, it's a capped cell, only one capped cell only. It hasn't emerged and it is sealed. So, and as far and, and as far as she's aware, she can't see any more. Colony is very large. Could you advise when I should go in again and check them? Uh, she says, oh, I think they are a cross bunch as they have no queen. Um, well, when when you have queen cell, cap queen cells, the advice is always to leave them well alone. Um, uh, for, but for sort of three weeks. But personally, I like to know that if there is a queen and she's emerged so if i know more or less when it's been capped um i will then go in um an appropriate time afterwards so that i'm looking to see literally on the day or so after she's emerged whether or not something has emerged from the cell very often they'll stay on the same frame for a day or two so you can you may quickly see the queen but i really just want to know that she has emerged and she's in there um mm. then obviously it's down to nature she may or may not make successfully but if you're going to be waiting another two or three weeks to find yeah. out whether or not she's mated that's a long time in yeah. our relatively short seasons to be finding out whether or not you've got a queen especially if you only got one colony um yeah. you know and on, the longer you leave it the more chance there is you may have you may develop laying workers and the less chance there is that you can um, introduce a queen by any other method so i tend to um I know all the books say, oh, you mustn't do this, but I, I always have a quick look at the frame. Um, you know, I'll put a pin in it so I know which one it is. I'll put the pin exactly above where the queen cell is um, and make a note to myself of its positions so that if I am taking it out, I'm not going to bash it or anything like that. You know, if I know, if I know it's on one side of the frame or, or another, I'll be careful that side of the frame. And I want to see really just has the has this has the cell got that little sort of hinge door open on it has it emerged if i see that is open then i'll just put the frame back and then i'll leave their own, their own devices um i just want to know that there is a queen in there um mm. you know, otherwise you need to start thinking about uh other other measures perhaps getting mm. a, a frame brood from elsewhere 
or a queen or what have you. Um, but so, once queen so is, you do have to be quite patient. Um, yeah. you know, it's surprising how long sometimes they do take to, to mate and um, begin laying. Mm. So in terms of Joe's question of when, when to go in next, it's kind of, she's just got to keep an eye on when the, the queen emerges um, from, from now until that happens um, before taking any further action. And so, so to keep checking, Richard, just uh, to, to... Well, it depends if she knows when it was capped. So once it's capped, mm. the queen should emerge in about eight days. Um, it, um, and then I would sort of perhaps go in on, on the ninth day what you don't want to do is doing is mucking around with the hive um, at the time when mm -hmm. um, the queen may be coming and going on her mating flights, in which case you might um, you know, perhaps disturb her or cause her to fly off or what have you. Yeah. So really, yeah. it's a case of whether or not she knows when the cell was capped. Um, you also need to bear in mind um, the fact that you look at the cell and see what the end of it looks like. When the queen's about to emerge, um, you'll see the wax is being thinned and very often it's right the way down just to the, almost to the, cocoon inside so it's just sort of brown and thin as opposed to being nicely sculpted like a peanut but do look at it carefully because sometimes a queen will emerge and then the, the bees will reseal it again and so you'll think there's still a queen <laughs> but there may not be and sometimes ah. if you look very carefully you'll see the sort of join where they've resealed it and you can use your fingernail or hive tool just to sort of flick that and it'll come open uh, and a little bemused looking worker will come out backwards because they they've gone up inside it and then the others have come along and sealed sealed them in <laughs> i had no idea that happened yeah. oh my yeah. goodness <laughs> wow i mean another um, thing um, I, I wouldn't really recommend this for someone who's quite new but if, if it looks like this queen cell is about to emerge um and you can really actually see that she's about to come out it, it, it's actually lovely just to open the end of the cell and see wow. the queen coming out there and yeah. then yeah oh well that's yeah. and, and rodri and wendy would you add add to that or uh, well, I'm looking down actually at um, the rest of Joe's email because um, she's mm -hmm. she has she's mentioned the fact that um, sometimes uh, that a colony will not accept a new queen, um, and that is very true. Actually, I have I've had quite a few um, situations where I've introduced a new queen. They've we've gone in and the queen seems to be laying beautifully, and the next time we go in. Uh, no sign of the queen and they've got a queen cell so sometimes they actually don't like the queen that you've given them and but they let her lay and then select one of the eggs to actually make their own queen ah. which is really annoying if you've gone out and spent 40 pounds or whatever you've spent oh, yeah. on a new queen um, but of course if you the only thing is if you buy in a new queen you do know that it's at least mated and laying um, uh, but you know there is always that problem that uh, of acceptance and my husband's actually made like a little a long cage um which we put we would open the um the traveling cage uh, when, when the queen arrives take the bottom lid off or the, the little so that they can get in and out but we'd put it over the top of um where there's some laying space some empty cells but also some brood that's about to hatch um, and so that when that brood emerges, it actually recognises the queen. It's the only queen they've ever seen. Uh, and she can actually start laying before she gets to go around in the hive. Um, that We tried that last year for the first time, and that really did work very well on acceptance. I just happen to have on my desk here, actually, um, which is more or less, I think, the same as you use, but this is one that you buy but this is what i use right. um for, for example, green introduction yeah yeah it's about that size and I, I do exactly the same thing um it's got a little door in it um but normally i'll just pop the queen on the, on a piece of um comb just as you said with some emerging ideally with some emerging um bees so as you say it's like that thing with the geese the first thing they see they think is mother yeah <laughs> and yeah. they pop pop that on on there and she's in there and they emerge and i, I don't think i've ever had um, a failed introduction um, using this method. There's a little bit of fondant, a little um, area, I don't know if you can see it there, but you just block it up with fondant and by the time the rest of them eat their way through. I also sometimes drizzle a little bit of syrup over this before I put it in so that the other bees get, you know, get around to licking it all clean and getting used to the smell of the new queen. 
Yeah. So that always works. Although, um, as you said, Wendy, it doesn't mean that a few weeks later they won't try and supersede her because for mm. one reason they don't actually like her. Mm. Another method I use um, is a paper bag. Really? Have you ever done that? <laughs> no. Okay. There have been occasions when I haven't had um, any of these and you basically remove the queen, old queen or um, you know make, make the colony queenless for, for about half an hour or so or an hour um, and then you just get a brown paper bag and get about 50 bees out of that colony and put them in the bag and scrunch the neck shut and leave them in there for about 10 minutes um, and then you just open it up again and put the queen in, close the bag again put a few pinpricks in it and then just loosely scrunch the bag up being careful not to squash the uh, queen or anything and then just put it between two frames and they'll nibble their way through the paper bag so you just put it in and then leave it for say seven days oh, i love it that oh, wow. <laughs> the advantage of using cool. page is that there as you said that she can actually get on with a little bit of laying perhaps um in there before yeah. that but the paper bag method does work excellent that's great that's really great um, we have John Main has just emailed uh, as, as well, and he said, Richard, you mentioned icing sugar as a varroa deterrent. Um, John says his dilemma is where to sprinkle the icing sugar at the top of the brood box, across the frame, or on, or on the face of the frame of bees. What's the best location to sprinkle it, and what's too much? Uh, I, I don't, I'm sure people have done scientific you know, tests and things on this. I'll tell you what I do, um, which is that, um, and I know some people are against icing sugar um, because it's very fine, and of course bees breathe through their spiracles. So some people think that perhaps um, uh, the icing sugar could clog those. I don't know really whether or not that's the case or not, um, but it certainly does work to knock varroa off. Um, so I go to the supermarket and just buy a big, um, as big as I can get, bottle of talcum powder. You know Johnson's baby talc for quid or something, wash it out really, really thoroughly, um, and then fill that with um, uh, icing sugar. And then, when I'm doing an inspection, when I've finished with each frame, while it's still out of the, of the hive, I'll just rest one corner of it on the, on the frames and I'll just get a couple of quick puffs on either side so that most bees have got a fine coating. Uh, um, and actually, it does help with the um, inspection especially if the bees are a bit feisty because they immediately start licking themselves and cleaning and they're more bothered about that than you know yeah. say hello yeah. to you. and then just put the fr put the frame back and i don't bother doing it so much now but when i first started doing it i would then put in the um you know the um tray underneath the inspection board and there was a, a noticeable increase in in mite drop as a result so just a quick couple of puffs um on either side and that seems to seem to do the trick i mean you can some people talk about you know kind of sprinting it down between the frames um you know what once you open, mm. open up or what have you and but that i tried that and that never seemed to it all seemed to clump on top of the on the top of the top bars and things like that so i find just puffing it directly on is is, is the best yeah works, brilliant thank you thanks very much uh Roger and wendy feel free to jump in if you've got any other other tips but i think that makes sense as well because you're actually covering the the frame yeah. so mm. it's good. when i first did it i i was thinking about it while i was having my hair cut at the hairdressers and they use ah. things for those little puffy things for puffing talc on your back of your neck and stuff you know the barbers and i went to, great go to a barber sorry <laughs> yeah see i'm nodding but actually no <laughs> and i went to great lengths and got a lot of money to buy it to find to go find a barber's supplies and buy one of these little bowls that, that they use to put talc in but you can only get a little bit and it kept clogging up so in the end it's just a bottle a talc bottle from the supermarket does that's it's a great idea yeah. and it's nice and natural so you can use the icing sugar and the bee gym as well so i think personally i'm going to go with that approach for my first first attempt definitely thank you that's and so. um, i've just seen um, an email coming from david parker asking what is the square white thing called richard to look on thorns or another supplier to buy um well, that's a very good question. I don't know what it's called. Um, I think it's just called a queen introduction cage. Um, I got my, the, my last batch I bought, um, and you can, I'm sure there are other places, I'm not trying to just promote one, but I bought them when I was at um, Bee Trade X from Becky's Bees. Becky's Bees, B-E-C-K-Y-S-B-E-Z. -E and I think they were about a pound each. Um, 
I think I've seen them in other places as well, but that's that's where I got got mine from. Um, but I've got, you know, I've probably got, um, you know, maybe, maybe ten of these, and they've been going for years and years. Eventually, the little spikes in the there's some spikes in the corner, and you pre push those into the comb to hold it, and they seem to snap or go, or you lose them. So um, you can just replace them with matchsticks, um, and then after after you've been using them, just give them a dunk in because the bees really properize up all these little holes. Um, just give them a dunk, you know, washing, washing soda, and they come up as good as new again. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're not very happy about handling um, queens, another thing I can um, suggest is you can get, I haven't got it here, because um, I don't tend to use it so much now, but you can buy, buy this little plastic, um, it looks a bit like um, a pipe, you know, that you smoke. So it's fat at one end and thin at the other, and you can, you can put the little cage that the queen comes in or wherever over her, and the queen will go into one end, which you bung up with, um sponge and then she she sort of walks up this little funnel which then fits very nicely in the that little oh, hole yeah. and then she walks in i mean nowadays i tend to just put, put the queen up plonk on the comb and then stick this down over the top but if you're worried about handling the queen or what have you um you can use this little device um just as a little way of introducing her into the, the production cage <laughs> it does amaze me how many little gadgets you can get for beekeeping yeah, it's incredible yeah. isn't it yeah be my girl <laughs> <laughs> about 90% of it is used once and never again <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you uh, so thanks David we hope hopefully that will help you find find one of your own um, we've had uh, Jem has uh, sent a question um, well she just asked for suggestions for easy queen rearing have it have the panel got any suggestions for easy queen rearing i personally tend to make up nukes and let them get on with it really and yeah um i did did experiment last year i was the year before um lost track now with the um the small polystyrene mini nukes mm. using mm. A, a cup of bees in a few of them and introducing some queen cells capped queen cells into that and that was pretty effective that worked quite well mm. all right thank you. um yeah, it's difficult, really, because easy, easy methods tend to rely on cells that the bees have made, you know, naturally, like you said, emergency queen cells or what have you. Um, uh, whereas once you get into grafting or um, Miller method or anything like that, it's quite a bit more complicated. And the, the most complicated thing about those methods of queen rearing is not really so much encouraging the bees to make queens, but how you deal with the queens afterwards like Rodri said you have to start having mini nukes and mm. uh, all that kind of stuff mm. which is not particularly difficult but um is a bit more of a faff yeah um i've been i've been doing it today actually i've just um, about a dozen queens um and then putting each one into a, a little mini nuke but then again out of that dozen you know perhaps only two thirds of them will result in queens that are, mm. are laying mm. um so i think what you know if you're doing it on a small scale as Rodri suggested, probably um, you know, splits and, and um, uh, relying on emergency, the emergency impulse. Yes. Is that how you do most of yours, Rodri? With, um... Yeah, I, I did try a few years ago using the Genta method, the Genta kit. Um, as you said, you need so much equipment and it, it's so time consuming and fiddly. I found it easier just to yeah. well, do an easy method and use uh, splits or uh, mini nukes where you introduce a queen cell seems to be effective and works for me i think it just depends on the scale doesn't it you know anything like grafting or using those cup kits it's fine if you want you know a dozen or more but most of us only only want a few queens each season don't we so. i have to say we tried a few years ago um the grafting and uh, actually <laughs> that didn't work at all uh, i think we got one queen from it um and she wasn't a good queen so um the grafting is hugely hugely difficult to do uh, and i think uh, i would agree i never had much luck with mini nukes um that that roger and you have uh, so i actually got rid of those but to split into a nuke to do that uh, i think the key thing there is to make sure you've actually got plenty plenty of bees in there and um, that's a, a real key thing. You can't think, oh, yeah, I think that's enough. You've got to be 
convinced that they have um, that there is a huge number of bees in that nuke and so it's got to be a pretty big colony that you that you would split the other way of doing it is if you've got um, and obviously both of these rely on you having um, queen cells uh, yourself anyway but um, another way that we've done it is a walk away split uh, and that's either if we've allowed the bees to go into two brood boxes and we've had um, found the queen and left her you know when obviously when there have been queen cells and um, find the queen and leave her in one box without any queen cells um, and then to literally walk away with the other brood box that's got the um, the queen cells in and reduce the number of queen cells if there are a lot in there and uh, leave them to create their own their own queen from hopefully from you know a couple of um, one uncapped and one capped but I think that I think that's the easiest way is to actually take take frames and create a new core or walk away split like that and we have just from a beginner's point of view as well and, and I'm going to be faced with requeening my colony I think um, when you are sort of rearing queens and, and putting them into nukes do you have to be quite careful of where those nukes are with in in terms of proximity to the original hive with the, the bees possibly going to that nuke or am I making this more complicated because um, <laughs> for me that's kind of it's of, of, of an issue of where the hives are when you're kind of requeening um or is that under it's kind of a case of um you know whenever you separate up a colony some of those bees are going to want to go back home mm. so it's just a case of making sure you put plenty of bees in there and, and knowing that enough of them are, are young enough and not going to want to leave and fly um straight back what I do um, is to um, shake brood frames. Um, so today, for example, I made up eight mini nukes, mm. uh, and I used bees that were on uh, brood frames, um, and I um, shook them lightly to start with, so a lot of the flying bees fell off, and what was remaining was the younger bees. Um, and I then shook those vigorously into a plastic container squirted them with sugar syrup so instead of them sort of flying around or what have you they all just sort of climb over one another and you can then just shake them into your mini nukes um, with one queen cell in each um, and i then shut those mini nukes up for about two days um, and bring them home and stick them in the garage where it's nice and cool and they make this amazing um roaring sort of sound um, and then that you know by the end of that process um they seem to sort of um you know want to stay with the queen and identify with that as a, being a sort of working unit and then I'll either take them back to my um, main apiary and just place them there and open, and open them up um, or take them somewhere further away obviously take them further away they're less likely to you're less likely to lose any bees um, from my experience if I just take them back to the apiary I don't think that many of them uh, do fly home there seem to be enough to keep the mini nukes going and they seem to get mated better in, in my apiary than other places I take them I, I think that's just a geographical thing I yeah think places mm. better than others I suppose depending on drone, drone congregation areas and so forth mm. okay that's well, great. I to say if, exactly what I do so <laughs> yeah oh, good. <laughs> well I actually usually leave them in this well if I if I'm not wanting to take them to another apiary I'll leave them in the same one but leave them closed in yeah. for a good, 20, right, yeah. a good 24 hours um, all of my hives and nukes have got open mesh floor and um, that's what we would do is actually to leave them closed in for at least 24 hours um, either with the closure or if um, if they're far enough away then um, I mean if they're what is it, less than three miles they're written they'll fly back mm. but um, to you can always stuff grass in uh, into the entrance and then by the time they've got themselves out of that then uh, they've forgotten where they were and they just reorientate to the new position and the new um, new hive if you confuse them enough they, they generally will do that I and mean, sometimes I'll say this and you out of a, a hive and, and move it you know just a couple of meters away um, mm. and I'll usually shut them in say if I do it in the evening um, and then the next mm. morning, or they get up i'll open the door and then i'll just cover the front of the hive with a load of branches ivy or anything like that as long as it's thick enough that they've got to crawl through it 
Yeah. Um, and the next morning, when you get, you know, as they come out, they will all automatically sort of reorient because they come out through all this stuff and think, oh, that, that wasn't there before. Yeah. If you turn the entrance in a different direction, um, that helps as well. Yeah. But it's surprising, you know, the rule book always says you have to move them, you know, less than three feet or more. No, yeah, no. I've had my measuring tape out just trying to think. <laughs> just, <laughs> and then, but I, I watched a video of someone doing that, Richard, putting a branch in front of the hive yeah. and, yeah, I thought it was yeah, brilliant. So out, they usually come out onto the branches and you see them sort of crawling around on the branches. Yeah. This is a bit funny. Um, yeah. but, uh, you know, before long, you'll have that big sort of crowd of them um, going around, a cloud of them going around in their sort of ever increasing circles, re just reorienting themselves. I mean, that's not to say that some won't go home, but, um, the, you know, the majority mm. enough to make a viable colony seem to stay, yeah. Mm. Awesome. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, Wendy, have you seen any other questions come in, but we're just, we're kind of at, at that time now anyway. Um, well, the only thing that, um, well, there's just a couple of comments that have come in. Um, one, if I can say from, uh, I can find it, from Andrew Gibb, our chief exec, um, about emer emergency queen cells and, uh, and um, supersedure cells. Um, emergency queen cells are not necessarily fed too well during larval stage and so not have so many ovaries and so be so well developed. Supersedure queens wow. are much better fed during the larval stage and so are better queens, um, which uh, reiterates what um, Richard was saying on that. And there's another comment here from... David Parker. David's actually sent um, sent us a link saying here is the research on icing sugar use um, from the scientific beekeeping beekeeping dot com. Yeah. Uh, so I mean okay, that's something I guess you could go to that site um, scientific beekeeping dot com and search for um, sugar dusting. Yeah, there's uh, lots of really really interesting articles on that site actually. Yeah, yes, it's a good site, isn't it? Very yeah. good. Um, the other thing I would just say is that um, the July issue has now gone to print. So what we can do is to, inc we're doing, I'm sure people are aware that we're um, taking questions and answers from the Hangouts and actually putting them into the magazine so, so we reach a wider audience. Uh, and I think that this link um, we could actually put into the into the magazine and the Hangouts page um, so that we can spread it around to anybody that isn't watching tonight and um, doesn't manage to catch up with the, yep. um, with what's going on. I think no, I think we've actually managed to cover all the questions, Claire. Well done. Oh, thank you. Thanks for your help answering and thanks for everybody for submitting some really, really good questions as well. And just to reiterate, this is a space for for us to help and the panel to help anyone with any questions so yeah please like join that. us in July. Um, what would be really nice would be the people that um, uh, have sent questions um, if before next month um, if they let us know how how they get on mm. I think it's always interesting to know actually what what does happen in the end. Yes yeah, some feedback. Mm. Yeah. yeah definitely I'd, I'd agree with that that'd be really wonderful. Thank you. And, and our next hangout is the 13th of July, um, Tuesday the 13th, so the, exactly one month's time. So, yeah, does anyone else have anything else they'd like to add? Or I'd just say very well done to our, our hostess for the first, yeah. um, first thank, hangout. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's been a pleasure. I'm looking forward to the next one. I should just say, actually, um, sorry, just going back again, um, this month's, or rather next month, July's, um, she does actually have um, a section in the um, series about queen rearing, all about using mini nukes um, and getting your queens mated. So look out for that in the next month's issue, July. Fabulous. That's brilliant. Thanks, Richard. All right. Well, thank right. you, everybody. Thanks for joining Hi, us. And hopefully... See you next time. Cheers. Next time. Bye. 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 Bye.